the visual identity for brands, I feel that needs to be on trend and moving into forward trends. So that includes your fonts, your colors, and the way that you photograph. Right now, it's pretty important. People want to have sustainable brands, for instance. So sustainability is great. We want to have a sustainable brand. We're not going to mark down like Kmart does and like sports go do. We're not going to mark down. We think that the dresses that we do could last for three or five years. And that's great. But the way that you photograph it and the graphics and the fonts that you use still need to be relevant now, knowing that they will need to evolve over time. But at the same time, we also want to have some longevity out of that design. Hi, and welcome to the Bright Minds of E-commerce podcast. I'm Dana, founder of Bright Red Marketing. And after helping so many businesses in the e-commerce space over the years, I wanted to bring you the best advice from Australian experts in e-commerce and e-commerce store owners. If you want any relatable stories and actionable advice and the latest Facebook advertising strategies, you're in the right place. Want help with your Facebook and Instagram ads? Remember, you can always book in a free strategy session at brightredmarketing.com.au forward slash free dash strategy dash session. We'll run through your ads, see what's working and what's not, and no sales pitch, I promise. So let's get into today's episode. On today's episode, we're joined by Carly from Studio Carly. Hi, Tana. Hey, it's so good to have you. So tell us a little bit about your background and experience with Studio Carly. Thanks for having me. So my background comes from a long line of fashion design. So I started working in fashion when I was 15 in the pattern room. So for those who are maybe fashion designers or starting fashion brands, they'll know what I mean by that. And I was really lucky after going to fashion school for the first couple of years. I was 17 when I started uni. I ended up landing a job at Rio Underwear. So I started designing for Rio, Whole Proof, Bonds, Ants Pants back then. So really commercial, high quantity, fast fashion products. So that time was, oh, I think about 18 years or more now ago, things were doing really well for those sort of brands. And my experience from there has taken me down a road of continuing to work with other fashion brands, smaller brands. In the last five years, I was working at Kiki K before they went into voluntary administration in product management. And then I started working for myself over in the e-com and digital space. My long line of fashion design has naturally evolved into working in digital and e-commerce and I guess because this space is still quite new and new to god I think they say maybe 10 years it's been 10 years since people have really been in e-commerce I've been able to take a lot of my previous brand building experience and product development experience and working with China and wholesalers and down to inner bags and what that looks like at a warehouse I've been able to use all of that into helping brands now especially fashion brands be able to start up on their own make sure that they have a really beautiful digital presence because that's really mainly the first place that you start and then how that looks like in terms of launching your Shopify store and making it scale so there's a lot involved and it's been amazing obviously you would probably feel this as well Dana but the demand has been very high, as you can imagine. A lot of people going out on their own, a lot of people starting businesses and small brands. And then, of course, even for the bigger brands, just making sure that they also keep up to date with their graphic design trends and e-commerce trends and just making sure all of that's moving fast where it needs to and the investments are put into the right place. Yeah, it's pretty much what I do. I love what you do. I had the pleasure of working with Carly on one of our clients and it was a very cool experience. She's very talented. Obviously, one of the things that you specialize in is that branding aspect. Why is that branding aspect so important and getting it right to a good e-commerce store? So if anyone was keeping up with the latest podcast and trend reports and future consumer reports at the moment, what we're seeing is now it's even more important for people to establish good brands. So going forward, you know, say we're entering this recession and people are being really careful where they spend their money. What the reports are telling us that people will spend with brands and brand loyalty is going to be really important in the next few years, especially here in Australia. So the branding element, I guess it's all about recognition, right? So when you have a good brand and someone wants to follow you and be a part of that brand, they're not necessarily buying a product from you, but they want to buy your brand experience and what your brand stands for and the lifestyle that brand allows you to have. So even if, say, you're you're selling dresses, 
So it's just a brand. You're just like, oh, yeah, I'm just selling dresses. And it's what can this dress do for you? Can this dress let you go to the beach, but it doesn't get sand on you and it's nice and flowy and lightweight. So the lifestyle aspect there is being on the beach and you can have this much more, you know, a nice beach experience. Or is this dress about going out or going to the races and it allows you to go to the races easily. It's not going to get dirty because you know what happens at the races. It goes with high heels. You can wear it dressy or casual, like lots of different lifestyle aspects that come into branding. So to me, branding is important. Number one, yes, you need good graphic design, nice logo, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really about the brand story telling and the brand messaging and the lifestyle that brand creates is really number one. And once you get that right, things tend to get a little bit more easier in terms of how you photograph it and the content creation around your social media. And yeah, therefore everything starts to be, I think, a little bit more easy for brands. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. I think something that we find a lot with clients especially is they come to us and like, oh, we sell this dress. And that's sort of as far as it's gotten. There's no story. There's no emotion. There's no, there's nothing different. And I think that's the thing that people have to remember that, as you said, I think when we were chatting before, like e com has been around for about 10 years. There's a lot yeah. of competition these days. There's lots of people selling yeah, it's a dresses. Lot. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that's not particularly exciting. But why is your dress different? Why should yeah. I buy from you? And I think that branding piece is so important. Yeah, especially for small brands that are starting up. You can go into Kmart and buy a dress you can go to Shen or Sheen or however you want to say I don't it think anyone knows just that buy a dress. <laughs> <laughs> I know but even saying that it's okay let's look at those two fast fashion brands for example who most of your audience is not going to want to be them but Kmart you have this branding aspect of family and Shen or Sheen is much more I guess it's youth fast fashion under 30s wear it TikTok it throw it in the bin kind of feeling so even though these are what do you call it, fast-paced, the branding element is still there and it's still really strong. And therefore, when you drill down into the smaller, so say both of those brands you can buy a dress from, but when you drill down into a smaller business where you're a luxury bohemian style brand that sells dresses, yeah, it's going to be a little bit deeper than that. It's going to be, okay, how does this make me feel at the beach or how does it make me feel at a barbecue and et cetera, et cetera, into the lifestyle a little bit deeper. Yeah. If anyone's listening and they are one of these people that are like, ah, oh, crap, I just sell a dress and I haven't really thought that process through and then not really having that strong branding, what would you recommend for someone at that point? They're, they've got a site, it's live, they've got a brand in terms of they've got a logo and they've, got, logo, some, yeah. they've got some fonts and that's um, what they would hold a brand is. But if they need that sort of next piece of the brand. I think the easiest way to do that that I found, which I'm not sure if other brand designers do it, but I start to look at content and content creation. We know our social media pillars, education, community, entertainment. Oh, what are the other two? Promotional and so there's one more. Anyway, normally I, four, four or five, I usually lay those out first and then I go, okay, what can we post around these pillars? So then if your educational is important across any brand, regardless if you're using graphic tiles or you're just on, on stories or whatever, wherever you are. So it's okay, if you're a fashion brand doing dresses, what can we tell our customers that educates them? Okay, therefore, we need to talk about fabric. We need to talk about how it was made. We want to talk about why it's made like that, how it's engineered. I love the word engineering around product development, product design. So therefore, if say you're, you're stuck in this education pillar, all of these things, it's like you start to find the ways to communicate different things about your product and then you can build on a lifestyle. I know it's a little bit complicated to explain over video, but I think that's the way I've managed to do it. So then you do, obviously, every brand will want to lay out their values, their mission and purpose their promise I think that's really important but it doesn't mean anything until you can actually translate that into content because content's the most important thing yeah we need to sell but without any content creation like we're just selling blanks like there's nothing happening at this point you probably should have a bit of a mission or a purpose around your dress brand I've seen a lot of missions that are like we sell beautiful dresses for women and it's just like okay let's go a little bit deeper so it would be our mission is that women can enjoy the beach lifestyle without feeling 
hot and sweaty not in those words but so Good it's idea. always yeah. talking about yeah it's always talking about how does the product make you feel and yeah often i've found the answers there are usually laying up that content creation piece early on and then building on it because then once you do start rolling out the brand you always have more ideas around education and most likely you'll be introducing some sort of purpose at some point where you're giving back or donating to another company and then you just start to build from there yeah i like that because it's not some go sit down and write out a 20 page business plan it's you've got to create your content anyway just make sure that you put that piece into that yeah. and really focus on that while you're creating that content not just yeah. creating content for the sake of it yeah yeah for sure and I think where most people go wrong from the start is that they launch and they just post photos of their product over and over again and, and we know you obviously know as well but yeah it's, you have to go deeper than that and it is quite challenging and I think there's also an opposite effect where it can actually get even more complicated so I've had a lot of clients come through where they would have their content done with a social media person so they get that early on so they might get their logo their colors their fonts and then they'll go work with the social media person and start rolling out the content and say a 30-day content plan but then they come back to me and they go but I don't actually know what to post so it's like thinking about okay you have all these ideas today we're going to talk about oh what shoes match the dresses that we wear at the beach and then, but then they go, well, how do I post that? And I go, maybe when you do your photo shoot, making sure that you pair your bohemian dress back with another local Australian brand that's doing awesome sandals. So you start to piece together the rest of the brand and what it stands for, because at the end of the day, we've, I've seen a lot of photo shoots that are just like, oh, it's our product. But it's, you can actually get so much more from that. So you can tag onto the accessories, tag onto the location. If you're shooting, say we want to bring that bohemian dress into a cafe, promoting that local cafe back and then you've got a sense of community there with your content creation as well. There's so much you can do when you start writing them down into those content pillars. And I almost feel like that's one of my favourite things to do because once you have that, I prefer to do that as well before designing. Because once you have that, it does get easier for the clients, you know, keep talking about their brand. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of people do that last and the way you've talked about it makes it really interesting because if you actually do it first, obviously you mm. won't have the content yet because you still have to do the photo shoot and those sorts of things, but you don't end up going, oh, we have nothing to post or, oh, we've had this really good idea, we want to do this, but we haven't got the content for it. So I think it's a really good place for people to start when they're feeling really stuck because it can be really overwhelming to go, actually, plan your content first in terms of what you want to post, go through your pillars and then go do your photo shoots, then create your content, then go do all yeah. these things because then you come from a consistent place and that consistency is so important. The consistency, yeah, obviously is number one important. I always preach that a lot because what can also happen is even though you get your branding done and you have this beautiful direction, photo shoots going to have all of this extra photography that we can use in, for content and et cetera, et cetera, often that it can get messy really quick. The branding can drop off almost instantly I've seen in cases which absolutely breaks my heart because as a designer when you're designing and putting this whole story together you're not just doing logo and a couple of colors you're building this whole story for them and then the client might start outsourcing the graphic design it might go offshore it might go to a junior because let's be honest I don't have any money at this point and the tiles all of a sudden end up with spelling mistakes the wrong fonts the line spacing the letter spacing is incorrect you just got to be really careful at that point because I know we talked about this a little bit early on but when just because you have your branding pack done it doesn't actually stop there it doesn't stop. It's the start of the work. It's the start. So when you're budgeting for your branding, so say you're going to put anywhere between, I don't know, it could be $500 up to five or $10,000 into this, it doesn't stop there. Making sure you always have a little bit of money to invest back into that brand designer and ensuring that you're working with a brand designer that you like and suits the aesthetic that you want to go for because so many times I've seen I've just seen it go wrong. And I don't think, and no brand designer like myself is going to be offended if you go with somebody else based on their aesthetic because they also want to design a particular way as well. So, yeah, just thinking about that when you start working with people, make sure you like them and keep a really good relationship with them because yeah. you are going to need to keep investing in the branding. 
Very good advice. I know another big focus of your work is around that sort of research component prior to that branding. Why is that so important and what do you mean by that research? What gets done? When I start looking at a brand, it really depends if we're going straight into visual direction or if we're starting with brand strategy. There's a lot of work that gets done. So the visual identity for brands, I feel that needs to be on trend and moving into forward trends. So that includes your fonts, your colors, and the way that you photograph. Right now, it's pretty important. People want to have sustainable brands, for instance. So sustainability is great. We want to have a sustainable brand. We're not going to mark down like Kmart does and like sports go do. We're not going to mark down. We think that the dresses that we do could last for three or five years. And that's great. But the way that you photograph it and the graphics and the fonts that you use still need to be relevant now, knowing that they will need to evolve over time. But at the same time, we also want to have some longevity out of that design. So in terms of a logo, it might be more simple because we want to get 10 years out of that logo. But our Instagram tiles, we might only be looking at eight or nine months if they're on trend right now. They're going to change. They always change. God, the trend's in social media changing so quickly um so the research that gets done around that is obviously looking at so i like to use fashion trend forecasting websites to get a lot of my inspiration in terms of color and what's what color is going to be on trend for 2024 to 2025 plus knowing that we're in a bit of a sustainable neutral space right now we know that a lot of those colors and neutrals are going to be on trend for a long time you think kim kardashian it's not going to go away that particular component but if we want a bold bright brand that's really edgy so obviously gradients have been here moving into bold large fonts so those sort of trends move really quickly so if we are going to go down that path i think princess polly that has a lot of gradient and, and loud fonts. If we are going to go down that path, is making sure that we can for, see that forecasting for another oh, at least, oh, I would hope, maybe two or three years. I already think that it's starting to drop off a little bit. So, yeah, fashion forecasting websites, obviously there's a lot of research that goes into competitor analysis. But I also think that when I talk to people about When they start their business and I say, oh, who would your competitors be? I actually don't really care so much because we don't want to be like them anyway. I I don't look at them in too much detail. Usually their competitors would be average. That's why they're starting this business. If you can find someone that you want to copy or rip off exactly, you're not unique enough. So you have to look at aspirational brands that you love but that you'd also spend money with. So we can sit here and say, oh, we want to be a luxury brand. We want to be like Chanel. And it's, do you buy from Chanel? Most likely not. Some people do. Yes, that's nice for them, but most likely not. So starting to look at aspirational brands that are doing awesome right now, they're on trend, they're a little bit forward, and then picking up on their aesthetics. But it has to be a mix because if someone comes to me and says, I want to be exactly like these guys, it's just they're already doing it. You need to look outside of the square. And plus, by the time you roll yours out, it's going to be a little bit old. It's been done. But saying that, yeah, saying that we trend and research, I've also found, which is a little bit more of a challenge here in Australia, if I show clients things that are just like fashion, the UK and the US are a lot more ahead of us in the way that they dress and the trends in their clothing and whatnot. If I show clients graphics that are relevant coming up, that aren't necessarily, oh, I guess, like mainstream right now, they get scared of that here in Australia. Not many of my clients or people that I talk to are ready to take the risk, which I think is okay. People still want to be commercial. A lot of people say, oh, I just want something like plain and simple and easy, and that's okay as well, just as long as we just keep it strong. It doesn't always have to be like loud and bold and crazy and add a million ingredients, but as long as the branding stays strong and consistent. Yeah, and all of that comes down to research. So, yeah, fashion forecasting websites, if you are a fashion designer, obviously your Pinterest, social media. Social media is a good one, I think, and TikTok is good for consumer behaviour. So it's what are the people wearing? What are they buying? What are they doing in their TikToks that's, like, relevant right now? There's so much to learn. Yeah, there's so much. I know that we there's like so to use competitor research just to make sure our ads don't look the same as everyone else. Oh, yeah, of course. That's um, a big thing. Like, obviously, you're in a feed, even with the stuff that you do, like, you're competing for real estate on these platforms if you look exactly the same as everyone else you look exactly the same as everyone else it's like on black friday we tell everyone don't do a black tile for your ad 
because everyone's doing, everyone's black, doing yeah. a black dial for their yeah. ad and it's just yeah. Black Friday sale. It's just your feed is full of black tiles with Black Friday on them. So I think that sort of research is really important as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the graphic design component, because if you're talking about ads, you're talking purely graphic designed ads at this point. Again, that comes back to trend, right? You might get your branding pack done. You might get three or four graphic tiles. I usually do up to 15 with my packs. But I've seen that a lot of other brand designers do just three or four. But you've got to be prepared that you're going to need to invest in those going forward. And they do need to stay consistent in fonts. So application can change and evolve, but yeah, they need to be strong, consistent, not do too many graphic tiles. From my experience in fashion brands particularly or product-based businesses, that the graphic tiles on their feed can perform the least or have the least engagement. So it's a really hard balance when you want to communicate your purpose or your sustainability messages or the engineering of your product through graphic tiles and writing, but no one's reading them and no one cares. And then you need this beautiful aesthetic of all your beautiful photos. Okay. So, yeah, hard balance. <laughs> it, it's hard. And especially because the trend we're seeing at the moment is that it's ads that don't look like ads. And all of a sudden yeah. you can't do fonts and graphic tiles because yeah, it looks like an ad. Right. <laughs> it looks like an ad. So then it's what makes them want to click. I think it's some of this, I don't know. Oh, I think what, what do I personally engage with? It's just this like people talking TikTok style being like hey how cool is this there's all these other little bits of content that can be a content or an ad without being an ad yeah you have to get yeah. clever yeah it's the day in the life of and the yes I doing like your makeup and the, this is yeah. me cleaning my house and this is me just sitting at my desk working this is me packing orders like people love that yeah. stuff oh pe- the behind the scenes is amazing this is me packing orders is is amazing making sure obviously you're wearing your product it looks good on you it's making your life easier yeah really important stuff Join TikTok. You'll see what everyone's doing. But doing it well. And just like jump on TikTok and post some um, TikToks of just like still images. Like they need to be, it needs to be the storytelling. I feel like you can't have a TikTok without having your own personal TikTok and consuming the content first because it's just a completely different world of content. It's changing, isn't it? And I think like I've been thinking about it lately it's like when you have your big brands like Country Road and Seed and then we have our small businesses coming up, obviously Country Road and Seed don't have the founder on TikTok like drinking coffee. So like when we're talking about content creation, I think in this case most of your audience is going to be in the smaller startup to scaling, right, not your Seed. But I don't think the, the but- CEO and marketing manager of Country Road are listening, but if you are, hello. <laughs> Hi. I think big that brands have a lot to learn from small businesses because these are the ones that are doing their really good content. They are they're more agile, they're able really to. quickly. Country Road's got probably a board that has to approve everything, whereas the people listening to yep. this, you can just decide to make a TikTok. You don't have to run it past legal. You don't have to run it yep. past some senior marketing manager. Just go do the fun content. If it works, it yeah. doesn't. And a lot of it has to be you. And I think that's where some brands get it wrong from the start because they go oh I'm just going to get a VA and then just do influences and it's like you need to have your lifestyle showcased as well and I don't want to say every brand has to do that because obviously there are some cases where it can still work but what yeah. one learning I had recently was were one of the brands that I work for the founder was she was doing pretty good reels she was in them a lot of Instagram lives or just talking to our customers all the time. Really growth stuff, working or connecting with a lot of mums as well, stay at her mums and whatnot. And she had her third baby and she said, which is great, but what she said was, oh, because I haven't been on stories, all my sales has dropped. So how crazy is that to think? So I think at this point she thought, oh, this is great because my business has been growing so well. It's fine. I can go and do that. But then all of a sudden she's not there and then the sales drop. So how do you, how do you make sure that you, if anyone else is in that situation, like how do you make sure that the business can keep running and you're still giving that content? You probably have to, in hindsight, you probably have to film a lot more before you want to take yeah. your holiday Being or whatnot. The, getting some influencers, getting content. some other team members, having yeah. your Facebook ads and stuff, using that content, even if it's not 
live. It's yeah, exactly. You need a backup, a right? Yeah. yeah. You've got to have the backup so you can't just rely on one avenue. It needs to be spread across yeah. the different social media platforms that we have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that I loved the most about working with you on our client was your recommendations for inc- improving that user experience. What would be some of your best tips for having the best user experience on a website? So in terms of fashion brands, some of the best tips, the branding has to be consistent, of course. The photography has to be amazing. And what I like to do is really drill down into the way that we communicate our product. And because I have had that fashion background in terms of engineering product and fitting, understanding the whole process, even when it comes down to how you're dyeing that fabric, what I've found is that there's a huge gap in the way people are really presenting their product pages. So if we jump straight from homepage to collection to products, actually, I might just take one step back there. A lot of the results tell us when people are shopping, they often go from home to about, especially in the small business phase. Number one, just making sure your about page is optimised. I like to tell my clients to invest in a personal branding shoot for the founder first if they can do that and not just have a photo of you just sitting there doing nothing you need to be you know packing the product or designing that product so firstly you're getting them you're getting that customer on a journey in the development of your brand and your range so that's number one so just thinking about the journey so they've landed on home they want to read a little bit more about you that page might also have your mission values purpose sustainability messages who you're giving back to etc there's a lot you can put on there and they're like, oh, yeah, this seems cool. And jump over to the collection page, scroll down. So one of the most important things, obviously, is going to be filtering. So making sure that they can filter by size, colour, material. I think material is really important these days because people will buy cotton or, or they're looking for natural fibres. So it might be a recycled or it might be a organic, lots of different things. So I'm not saying they just buy cotton, but where I think small businesses can win is if they're not just using fast fashion, crappy polyester, that they can really talk about their materials on that page. Obviously, they need to be able to search by size and colour and then product type as well. So you can search by dresses or pants or, or making sure that those, so those collections are set up correctly from the start. There's nothing worse than ending up on someone's website trying to find something and just getting completely and you're like but I just wanted to see all of the t-shirts in one page like I didn't want t-shirts and dresses I just wanted t-shirts I just did an order on one and I was like oh my god there's no actually you could find the category by the menu but you couldn't filter once you're on the collection page at the bottom I was like oh it's so easy and if you're with Shopify 2.0 which hopefully everyone that's listening has moved over to it's much easier to do you don't have to worry too much about getting that filtering set up pretty smoothly now and then so yeah so say they can filter they've found all their dresses awesome it's great if we can show them all the colors that dress comes with so it's more common in small businesses where they'll have one product set up when it's got one floral and then the next one's the same product but it's pink and then the next one's the same product it's blue so making sure that if they land then from the collection page into the product page we're looking at our dress that they can see that it does come in other colors because I think this is just one from all my years of being a shopping addict is that if I find something I love, I will buy it in multiple colours. And I think especially for businesses that are selling core products, so, yeah, if they're selling an awesome T-shirt and it's just a core T-shirt, you do need to see those other colours. A little bit more tricky to do in terms of the actual build if you want to show all the colors on your product page but also show them split out on your collection page you can do that there's just a few technical things that you need to do in there i think mr zimmy do a very good job of that yeah there's a few brands that do do it but it can still happen i would say mr zimmy is in tier starting to move into yeah. bigger business but you can still do it in small businesses in my startups i will still have that set up for them it just makes it easier so we're landing on our product page making sure that we need to show that we take after pay or anything else. We need to have a really nice product name that's easy for them to understand and remember. I prefer, so rather than saying, oh, basic t-shirt, and it's, oh my God, what does that mean? So let's give it some names, especially if you're a small business, you can control that. And if you're going to repeat that style in the new color in the season, next season, it's nice to know that they, I think Shona Joy do a pretty good job of that actually. And then we have our being able to easily shop by size and colour at this point, our add to cart button. Our product descriptions need to be amazing. I prefer to have our product descriptions 
just one to two sentences as long as they nail it. I know SEO can be a concern around this as well. So nailing that product description and then having a nice clear list of your product details. So is that a, a gold zip or is it a silver zip? Just listing out those product details, those key product details that you need. I like to, so at this point, you're into your drop downs. I like to have, especially in 2.0, this would be the standard now. So just thinking that you're going to have all the information just like in a big long paragraph, it's just not going to happen now. You need to split these up into your little drop downs or your meta fields for the technical speakers. Talk about our materials and how to care for it. We need to talk about the sizing and the size guide. So making sure that we have a size chart linked to our product page and then what the measurements of that garment. So if it's a dress, we need to, we want to know the customer needs to know the length and say the waist or the hip or the bust or whatever. The strap length of that dress is a lot of information that's not on your size chart, your branded size chart. From there, making sure that we communicate our shipping and returns just quickly, the key details of We Ship Australia Wide, it's free over 150 or it's $10 flat rate. Right? Just keep it really neat and then we can always click through to more information. I also like to have a drop down that would be around brand with purpose or conscious fashion or engineered for longevity, something around a key. I guess it's like a UVP of the brand or the business. Say it was conscious fashion, then that drop down would be like, we only do organic cotton and then you can go and find out more. Or, or Manufacturing Australia is a really good one to have. So just thinking about something a little bit extra on that page and then making sure, I think I've covered all of the drop downs there that you would need as a starting. Some people have more, some people have less. And then would make sure, I think outfit shopping is going to be up trending pretty quickly. I don't see it so much on smaller businesses. It is a little bit more te- technical too. There's a lot more work in terms of creating those things. Yeah. If you're selling lingerie, for example, and you've got a bra and a knicker, you've got to be able to add that knicker on, like on the same page as you're shopping on the bra, where it's like someone's wearing the dress, the jacket and the the shoes and stuff. It's probably not as important, but I now I've just been implementing a little bit more like shop the look on the, in the next level. And then you can go into recently viewed, or you may also like, there's a few different options. There's no kind of one size fits all. And then obviously you would need some reviews. You'd hopefully start to collect some reviews on these products as well. One trick I like to do is just to hide all reviews until a review is left. So you don't have empty stars for products because as we all know, yeah, if you're really small and things, you haven't sold something yet. You have, sometimes you don't get the reviews anyway. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Across the board, across the board, everyone's struggling to get reviews. You probably, are you feeling the same? I don't know. Yeah. It's hard. Like even clients that are really actively trying to get reviews, aren't getting them and then yeah. they've got no reviews because then it's not that they haven't sold anything it's just getting reviews no. from people is like pulling teeth at the moment yeah my advice for that especially if it's a solopreneur owner when they ask me like how do I get more reviews what can we do I'm like just e- go and email them go yeah. and stalk them on Even Instagram that's hard. call them <laughs> I know I'm like you've just got to reach out on the personal effect because it's just not working. It's not working. Even giving away $50 for your review doesn't mean that they want to shop with you because they still have to spend more money to give you a voucher. And I think, I mean, if you can call some of your clients that's going to be or customers, that's going to be best case scenario. As someone who doesn't like answering the phone, I don't like that. <laughs> I know. Okay, email. <laughs> but email Look, if you're confident in that calling them, call them. It. Yeah, I have one brand who does some pretty special products and their designer calls their customers all the time and their community is amazing. They have so much community feedback because they've said to me recently, they're like, we know our customers want colour. They keep asking us. And how do they know that? We just assume the customers know what they want or we go, oh, we'll just do it in black because we know black sales. And it's our customers are asking. They're talking to them. They're understanding their fit. And yeah, I think it's pretty important. And if you're set up and everything's running awesome and you've got Clavio when you can filter or segment out your VIP customers and narrow it down to say your top 20 customers that have spent the most money with you or the, whatever it might be it might only be 20 emails and 20 calls that you need to make and those customers are most likely going to want to get involved you'd be surprised how much if you already know they have brand loyalty like they'll talk to you on the phone yeah so you're probably not going to call them let's say don't call anyone Email figure them out first. Who, who the, yeah, email them first, say, I'd love to get on. 
I would love to see my clients do get those top 10 or 20 customers and get them all on a Zoom workshop together. Just talk through the next range. I I love love that. that. I love that so much. Do you have anything you think we've missed? I think what I've learned the most is pay an expert to set up your shop correctly and they'll learn how to edit and optimize because there's nothing... D- all, every DIY shop I've seen is horrible, especially going into this new phase now where branding needs to be strong, design needs to be better. Pay and invest for the setup and then with them, make sure you get your training included in the package because otherwise if you don't start to yourself, you just drain money. You always need money to invest back into that platform, so make sure that you're budgeting for that. I love also that. start to think about most people will come and get a quote on branding and a website and then they completely miss the mark that setting up Clavio and Clavio flows or email marketing could cost you actually more than the website itself yeah. so it's actually really important to think about how you're going to get those flows happening because you are going to need them the various rates could be $500 set up all the way up to 10,000 again for yeah. Clavio so thinking about that I think that's so true like in the budget side of things like I think a lot of people put every last dollar into something and they have yeah. nothing left to do the Facebook ads or the social media or yeah, the website that. or the Clavio. Like you need to not yeah. spend every dollar into one thing because all of the other pieces need to match in as well. Yeah, yeah. And even then the website doesn't stop, right? Because even after a few months, it's like, hey, most likely you're not going to set up a new website with upselling. And uh, there's just there's always something to do. There's always something to like update and improve. So thinking about investment back into that platform, trying different things, swapping banner images all the time. I think one of my biggest ones, this is going to be a personal grab there. At the moment, the way that the world's moving, just stop using any single-use plastics to pull off the poly bags. Start really thinking about how you can make your product more conscious and how, and not even the product, but how you're presenting your brand. I've definitely been talk around. I know a lot of people do thank you cards with a discount. So can we get those to customers and that experience without having to waste materials all the time? Because I think the more conscious you can thing. be across everything, yeah, it's going to actually, if you don't have that unboxing experience in the current world, it's going to be brand damaging. So that was one one that I think about. And I think that's probably it. It's we could talk about yeah. this for hours, I think. Forever. <laughs> Investing, um, brands, platform, influence, video creation, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok ads, photography, markets, so networking, much. wholesale, trade shows, lookbooks, just thinking about everything, not just go, oh, I just want to start selling some stuff online because it does get big. And yeah, just making sure that you understand the investment and what it takes to run a business. And you can talk to, there's lots of consultants in this space, hire the right designer that fits your aesthetics, understand what each creative person does and what their strengths are. And just really start to learn it up to the weekend. Lovely. We'll just get into the last couple of questions we ask everyone, but thank you so much for sharing so much. It's been really good information. Do you have any strategies or habits that you personally follow to help you stay on track in your business? Yeah, I use Toggle Track and Toggle Plan as my product project management systems. And I also block out my calendar and color code everything that I do. So I've got client workers plan, appointments, meetings, everything's color coded. So that is how I stay on track, saying that I'm generally booked out four to six months in advance. For sure. And do you have a favorite podcast? Oh, uh, yes. I love Unofficial Shopify podcast. Oh, so nice. it is American based, but I love it. And I think. I really enjoy it because they talk about so much more. Much like your podcast, it's not just about Shopify at all. It's about brand building. It can be about design, what's happening in marketing. And that helps me stay ahead because because it's American-based and they're working with big companies over there. It's, okay, all this stuff's coming here now. So that's my favourite Shopify podcast. Oh, and also Fashion Business Mindset, which is another mm-hmm. awesome podcast with a lot of fashion change makers and leaders based here in Australia. So a lot to learn from that if you are a fashion business. You have lots of fashion clients. I'll learn lots from that one. And if people want to visit you, learn more, potentially work with you, what's the best way for people to reach out? Yeah, just my website is studiocarly.com, nice and easy, or carly at studiocarly.com. Very easy. Same with social media. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Dana. I'll speak to you again. I'm sure we will have more to talk about when everything changes again in another year. (laughs) Probably give it six months. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, six months. Oh my God, next week, next week, there'll be something new. Thank you for listening to the Bright Minds of E-commerce podcast. As always, you can find the show notes at brightredmarketing.com.au forward slash episode 42. Thanks for listening.